Lecture 12, Lock Convoys, Atomics, and Lock Freedom. All right, question to think about, just to get the conversation started. Why does it take a long time for a line of cars to start at a green light? All right, you've probably encountered this situation, uh, and uh, if you have, you'll know that generally the the thing is that you know you don't start moving until the car ahead of you has started moving, and so on and so on, uh, and this continues uh, all all the way along. Uh, so there is a certain delay. The light has turned green, but the group of cars don't all move as a block. Uh, there is a little bit of spacing out of those vehicles uh, before they actually get moving. That makes a certain amount of sense. Um, just on safety reasons, uh, you wouldn't want to be driving you know, at the same distance behind a car uh, that you would uh, when you're stopped behind them at a uh, at a stoplight, um, especially as speed increases, that becomes unsafe. Um, but that's the kind of thing that we are interested in thinking about today, uh, and it is referred to as a lock convoy. Uh, the Lock Convoy is a little bit like a, a lock traffic jam. It can happen when we have at least two threads contending for a lock of some sort. Uh, and a full description of this is, well, a lock convoy is a situation which occurs when two or more threads at the same priority, frequently, as in several times per quantum, uh, acquire a synchronization object, even if they only hold that object for a very short amount of time. It happens most often with critical sections, but can occur with a mutex and anything else as well. For a while, the threads may go along happily without contending over the object, but eventually some threads' quantum will expire while it holds that object, and the problem begins. The expired thread, let's call it thread A, stops running, and the next thread at that priority level begins. So that thread, we'll call it B, gets to a point where it needs to acquire the object, and it blocks on that object. The kernel chooses the next thread in the priority queue. Uh, if there are more threads at the same priority that try to acquire the object, they get blocked as well, and they, uh, and they block on the object as well. This continues until the kernel returns to thread A, which owns the object. That thread begins running and releases it. Here are two important points. Uh, once thread A releases the object, the kernel chooses a thread that's blocked waiting for it, probably thread B, uh, makes the thread the next owner of the object and marks it as runnable. Next, thread A hasn't expired its quantum yet, so it continues running rather than switching immediately to thread B. Uh, since the threads in this scenario acquire the synchronization object frequently, thread A soon comes back to the point where it needs to acquire the object again. This time, thread B owns it. So thread A blocks, and the kernel again chooses the next queue in the uh, next thread in the priority queue to run. It eventually gets to thread B, who does its work while owning the object, re then releases the object. The next thread blocked receives ownership, uh, and this cycle continues endlessly until eventually the threads stop acquiring so often. Okay, uh, that technical definition might be a little hard to imagine, so we'll try to uh, explain it and revisit it a little bit so that it is perhaps clearer in your mind. Um, why are we calling it a lock convoy to begin with? Well, a convoy is when a grouping of vehicles, usually trucks or ships, travels all closely together. A freighter convoy, for example, might carry freight from one seaport to another, uh, and in our computing context, it means all of our threads are moving together in a tight group. Uh, this is also sometimes called the boxcar problem, which is why we're looking at some train cars there. I mean, these are tanks as opposed to um, uh, boxcars, but uh, same idea. Uh, and imagine that you have a train that is pulling uh, a bunch of boxcars along some railroad tracks and we're starting at a complete stop. If we do that, uh, then when the engine starts to pull, it moves the first car forward a little tiny bit before uh, it stops suddenly because the car behind, there's you know, some slack in the linkage. So the first car starts moving, it pulls the slack out of the linkage, and then there's a bit of a stop because uh, the uh, linkage is taut and all of the train cars behind, which are not moving, uh, slow down your progress. And so then the second one starts moving again until all the slack is out of the linkage uh, and so on and so on. Uh, and this 
problem resembles the kind of motion described when the train is getting started because, well, each thread takes a very small step forward before it stops, and then some other car gets a turn and it moves forward a tiny bit before stopping, and so on and so on. Uh, and what we actually observe is that, well, all of our threads are waiting and fighting over the same lock, and therefore, um, we're spending a lot of CPU time on context switches and very little on executing actual code. So we end up with something like this, where uh, at the beginning we have a lock that is acquired, uh, and then we have a context switch during the critical section. The critical section here is denoted by the little uh, horizontal bars. Uh, and in the uh, quotation that was the explanation, we refer to a quantum. Quantums are time slices, that is the amount of time that we are executing our code. Uh, and um, at some point our time slice will expire, uh, and that is usually not paying any attention to whether or not we happen to be holding on to a mutex or several at a time. Uh, this makes a certain amount of sense, otherwise you know, acquiring a mutex would be you know, armor against there ever being a thread switch, which wouldn't make sense. Um, that would be undesirable behavior, to be sure. Uh, but with that in mind, that thread switch could come at any time, even one that's inconvenient. Uh, and so what actually happens uh, is that you know, thread A gets blocked, uh, and then nobody can acquire the lock, because thread A has it, but and it's in the critical section, but also can't release it because it hasn't run to completion yet. Uh, and so what we eventually end up with is we have a lot of context switches because a thread acquires the lock, does its thing, releases it, gets blocked, uh, and so the next thread that gets unblocked can run its critical section, maybe, which is short, because we said that the length of the critical section is small compared to a time slice, uh, and then gets blocked, because as soon as we release the lock, it's assigned to somebody else, and we are waiting. Ultimately, we have too much CPU time um, that's going to the context switches, because as soon as a thread is unblocked, it does its tiny critical section, uh, and very shortly thereafter it gets blocked again, so we do a switch, uh, and while your time slices might be X amount of time, we might only be using 5% of that amount of time, so our time slices end up very short, uh, and switching between threads is somewhat expensive. So, yeah, there are weird side effects of this, um, and because the threads that are uh, acquiring the lock frequently and run for very short periods of time get blocked more or less immediately thereafter, um, other unrelated threads that uh, are of similar or same priority uh, get to run for an unusually large percentage of the wall clock time, leading you perhaps to conclude that a different process is the real offender in this scenario, and you're thinking, like, why is this program taking so much CPU? It's not really, it's not taking a disproportionate amount, it just so happens that there's a lot of CPU available. But if you go down the wrong road and you're like, oh, I want to kill that process, or I want to <laughs> rewrite it so it is somehow more efficient, you're not actually solving the underlying problem because you've been pointed at the wrong offender. Um, so, what actually solved this? The answer is unfair locks, and the point that I'm going to advance here, believe it or not, is that unfair is perhaps more fair. Uh, and this is solved in Windows Vista and later, so like Windows XP and earlier implementations have a fair uh, implementation of locks. Uh, and an explanation explain an explanation will explain why fair is worse for performance than unfair, even though it may offend your sensibilities. Um, so in Windows XP, if a lock L is unlocked by A and there is a thread B waiting, then what we do is immediately assign ownership of the lock to this thread B uh, and say that thread B is ready to run. Again, think back to an operating system course where we talked about being blocked on something in particular. So if we are no longer blocked, we'll be marked as ready to run, uh, and then we will be able to continue. Since B is no longer blocked and B already owns the lock when it wakes up, then it will be able to proceed immediately. The lock can never be stolen, uh, and hence it is fair. Nobody else could sneak in and use the resource while B is waiting, while B is blocked. It's just been assigned to B. It says, B, you're next, uh, although B doesn't actually run until uh, it gets um, 
until it gets selected by the operating system scheduler. Okay, um, that is reasonable. I mean, why is it B? Um, it could be that B happens to be first in line, but there's no strict requirement for that. Um, if the operating system chooses uh, randomly amongst all the waiting threads who gets the lock, that's perfectly fair. Um, it doesn't matter how long necessarily B has been waiting. Uh, but what defines fair versus unfair here is that if it's your turn next, it is your turn and nobody can take your turn away from you. However, turns are decided it is up to the operating system. However, um, there is a period of time where the lock is held by B, but B is not running because, well, we haven't um, we haven't really um, we haven't chosen B yet, or at least the operating system hasn't chosen B. So if thread C starts to run and it requests lock L, it gets stuck and it gets blocked and it you know, waits for it, and we have more context switch costs. Thing is that B hasn't entered the critical section yet because it hasn't acquired the lock and had a chance to run. It's only acquired the lock. So in theory, we could let C have a turn, even though B was supposed to be next, which does totally let C cut in line, but it's currently C's turn to execute and B isn't in the middle of the critical section, so there's nothing wrong with letting C have a turn. It doesn't change the correctness of your program. So why shouldn't we allow this? I mean, it goes against some ingrained sense of fairness, I guess. Uh, and studies do seem to show that people do have an innate sense of fairness, and uh, other primates apparently have a sense of fairness as well, so it's uh, something we observe in the animal kingdom. But, I mean, you know, these are computer tasks, they are threads, they are you know, processes, they don't have feelings. The thread B will not be offended by the fact that thread C gets a turn, uh, even though it's not, uh, you know, not supposed to. So thread A releases lock L, and B wants it, uh, and if an unfair scenario, then B doesn't get it. Um, it's just, we'll let A thread run, and if it's B, it could request L and get it, um, but if C gets a chance to run first, it gets the lock, it computes, uh, and if it wants L, it might get it, it might release it before we switch threads. Uh, if it didn't need the lock, then there's nothing to see here, there's nothing to, to do. Uh, and ultimately, that is making better use of your CPU resources before uh, B gets a chance to run. C was already running, we don't have to context switch, we can just let it get the lock, do its critical section, exit, and leave, uh, without having uh, a penalty of another context switch. Uh, in Windows, anyway, a context switch time is something on the order of 4,000 to 10,000 CPU cycles. It is not instant. It is not you know, a horrible, terrifying, you know, nobody could survive this level of cost. Uh, but it is unnecessary. You know, imagine paying you know, 6,000 cycles uh, of wasted time that you don't need to and doing it a lot. Why? Uh, so... Unfair locks really help with this um, because they allow threads to use the lock more efficiently, use this resource more efficiently, even though it goes against that sort of built-in sense of fairness that we may feel. Um, and this is a reminder of sorts not to anthropomorphize uh, the computer things too much. I, I might talk about, you know, the, the threads and say uh, um, threads communicate with one another by... Uh, Say you know, one one says to the other, "Hey, you! Here is some data for you." Or uh, you know, a thread misses its turn because some some other thread you know, cut ahead of it in line. That kind of thing. Uh, it it's important not to assign human feelings to threads because they are just you know, computer constructs, uh, and they don't get offended. They don't feel sad. Uh, and, and they don't you know, write letters of complaint to the operating system scheduler when they feel that they have been slighted in some way, uh, in a way that you know, wouldn't work with people, right? You know, there's, there's, no, um, there's no comparison. So we, we talk about um, threads as, as though they're people, but it's important to remember that they're not, uh, and they don't get uh, upset. So one way you could diagnose a lock convoy is you could see there is a lock uh, and there are several threads waiting for it, but there are no uh, owners of this lock. Uh, 
at present. Um, it just so happens we're in the middle of a handover, so one thread has signaled or unlocked that mutex, um, and the other thread has not woken up to run it yet. Changing the locks to be unfair uh, is something that does potentially risk a little bit of starvation because you, know, you could always be unlucky and somebody always sneaks in and takes your turn. That's not necessarily going to happen. Um, it's fairly unlikely given a thread would have to be very low priority and very unlucky. Uh, and your system would have to be you know, busy at all times. Windows gives a thread a priority boost, just for an example, temporarily after it gets unblocked, to see to it that a thread that is unblocked gets a chance to run fairly soon. Uh, so it's, it's been waiting for some time, and now you know, its hour has arrived, or you know, its time slice has arrived, I guess, uh, and we actually want to give it that opportunity now that it's ready again. Now, um, I mentioned that unfair locks are implemented in versions of Windows from Vista and onward, uh, and that's one solution, which is give away your problem to the operating system. If uh, we wanted to solve it ourselves, you know, and, and it's an operating system level problem, well, you know, you can't. It's the operating system that is responsible for it, so, you know, okay, we have to live with whatever system we get, right? Well, not quite. We have some options for solving it ourselves. There are some things that we could do in our program uh, that will help uh, to mitigate the cost of lock convoys, uh, even without having control over whether locks are fair or unfair. Um, and one of them is take a nap. Uh, we could make it so that threads that are not in the lock convoy call a sleep system call fairly regularly to make sure that other threads get a chance to run because they're the ones that are taking disproportionate amount of CPU time. Um, but that's silly. Um, we're changing threads that are not the offenders in this scenario, uh, and it's band-aiding the situation so the convoy doesn't really lower performance quite so badly. Um, but I don't think this is a good solution. I don't think it's something that comes recommended uh, as a band-aid. If you have no control over the uh, threads or, or processes that are involved in the convoy, but you do have control over other ones, I guess you could do it. Uh, but it's not a great plan. Uh, it's not an ideal solution, uh, and I really don't suggest it. Um, so yeah, I think that solution is lame. Uh, and we're still doing a lot of thread switches in this scenario, and the goal is to reduce the number, not increase it. So what can we do about that? Uh, well, uh, one idea is that uh, you know, sharing is caring. Um, can we use a reader's writer's lock to allow much more concurrency than we would get if everything used exclusive locking. Um, if there will be a lot of writes, there's not really much benefit to this. If every uh, interaction with the shared data could be a write, you have to use exclusive locks every time. But if some of them are reads only, then you could use readers writers locks, which allow multiple reads in parallel because reads don't interfere with one another, uh, and therefore they can happen in parallel without any issue. So yeah, that would be something that we could try. Um, we could also try to find a way to break down critical sections into smaller ones, which reduce contention over the same locks that is uh, a, a little bit um, a little bit effective in some scenarios and actually worsens the problem in others uh, if everybody's fighting over the same critical section uh, then of course splitting it up means that we're now fighting over two critical sections and that reduces contention over the single one um, but it makes your critical section even smaller uh, and part of the reason that we get into this problem is that the critical section is so small that it is something that might run several times per time slice. So if we can do it correctly and if we can do a good job of it uh, and it doesn't make our problem worse, then sure, we could do it, but we are uh, not necessarily going to solve the problem that way. Um, the next idea is to change how and when you want the data. If you can shrink the critical section to you know, pull a copy of the shared data and do some operations on it or something, it reduces the amount of time the lock is held. Uh, and again, it makes your critical section smaller, which means you could actually acquire it and release it more times per time slice, uh, but at least you would be holding onto it for a smaller period of time and there's less chance that a switch happens while you're holding onto it. Um, but you saw the earlier discussion about critical section sizes, so you did this already and your critical section is already minimal, right? 
Uh, and then the last solution is a trilock primitive with some sort of limit. Uh, and that is you use trilock to try to acquire the resource. If you don't, you don't get blocked, but you just wait a little bit and try again. Uh, and uh, if you reach a retries limit, you know, you've tried 10 times and you didn't get it, then you just give up and you do a blocking call. This works given two conditions uh, that are uh, actually both mandatory. So one of them is that uh, we have a multi-core uh, CPU. Otherwise, uh, we're not helping ourselves when we retry uh, without a context switch. Uh, if it's a single core CPU and we are doing try lock, we're just wasting time because um, we are consuming the CPU time that should be going to the thread that's holding the lock so it can finish and exit the critical section. Um, but uh, that obviously uh, is not going to be too much of a concern these days since there are uh, usually multi-core type systems. Um, the other thing that uh, is important for this to work, for it to be better, is that the period of time in which a lock could be held has to be pretty short, uh, so that trying again uh, basically immediately following uh, or very shortly thereafter is not a problem. Uh, it, if the lock is going to be held for a comparatively long period, you know, one full second or something, then retrying several times in the same time slice is silly because we should just wait, we should just enter the queue. But if the amount of time that the lock is going to be held is very short, especially compared to the amount of time that is spent uh, waiting, uh, the amount of time spent in the critical section, then we're going to get a benefit out of the try lock behavior. So we set our retries to zero, our retries limit is 10, uh, and the counter uh, goes in a mutex. Uh, and if retries is less than the limit, we will try lock. If we succeeded, then we will uh, break out of the loop and we can uh, assign the value as we need. Uh, otherwise, uh, retries uh, is uh, incremented and we call yield now. Um, yield now is just a hint to the scheduler, uh, and uh, we're, we're going to say that uh, it is a suggestion where you say, well, uh, listen, uh, I don't have anything super useful to do right now, so if there's something that's more important, please take the wheel. Uh, otherwise, uh, the scheduler will let us continue. Um, in, in a world in which people regularly go to the office, you can think of this as being like waiting for the coffee machine at the office in the morning. Uh, if you find there is a line, you might decide to do something else and come back later. Uh, if you've already tried the come back later approach and there's still a line, for some reason you might as well just get in line because uh, that's the fastest way to get the uh, caffeine that you're looking for. So it does look like polling for the critical section because it is, uh, with a limit. Uh, and the limit on the number of tries helps in case the critical section belongs to some low-priority thread, and we want the current thread to be blocked so the low-priority thread can get an opportunity to run. Um, and under this scheme, if A is going to release a critical section, B doesn't necessarily immediately become the owner. Uh, A may keep running, and A might get the critical section again before B tries again. Uh, and even if the spin limit is as low as two, uh, this does mean that two threads could potentially recover from uh, contention over a lock without forming a lock convoy. So the, even having a, a retry with try lock of just two makes a significant difference. Uh, we'll also talk about a related couple of problems, the thundering herd problem and the lost wake-up problem. Uh, and this is mostly for a distinction because they're similar but not the same. Uh, and so the uh, thundering herd problem uh, is, well, a, a condition is fulfilled uh, and lots of threads immediately want to jump on that. Um, in the Thundering Herd problem, if we do a broadcast, for example, on a condition variable, it triggers a large number of threads to wake up, anybody who was waiting on that condition. Uh, and it's likely they can't all proceed, but some will get blocked and woken again in the future, that kind of thing. Um, and if you, could, uh, if you could limit it so you wake up one thread at a time, that would potentially uh, mitigate this, because if you wake up ten threads and they all say, all right, well, I need to go into the critical section, it won't work. 
because only one of them can go into the critical section at a time, uh, and waking them all up just results in everybody immediately fighting over that resource. You're probably also familiar with something like the thundering herd problem if ever uh, you have been waiting to, I don't know, try to get a CPU or GPU uh, or a console that is in short supply. There are ways of being notified that a particular store has the thing that you want in stock. Uh, but of course, if you can get that information, so can lots of people. And so if there are 10 PlayStation 5s currently in stock at a store and a notification goes out, then everybody really tries to jump on it and uh, everybody is fighting over a very limited stock. Uh, and we potentially end up overloading the website of whatever retailer has been so fortunate as to acquire those uh, hard to acquire consoles. And uh, in that case, actually, everybody's worse off. Uh, if they formed uh, a more orderly queue where you registered for a back order and uh, when it's uh, in stock, they call people in order uh, of their back order, then you would not have this thundering herd problem. Admittedly, will the retailer do that? I mean, it's extra work for them, and I don't think they care that much because selling it to person A is just as good as selling it to person B, and it's not important to them whether uh, it, it was uh, somebody who was waiting a long time or somebody who just happened to stroll into the store today and said, hey, by chance, do you have any PlayStation 5s? Uh, but you know, the store doesn't care. Uh, however, you might care, uh, and you might prefer to give your business to the kind of organization that will make a wait list and call you on the wait list. Uh, and also, for the record, I don't have a PlayStation 5, nor any chance of, uh, of getting one. Uh, I'm not really into that because I play on PC in the uh, rare occasion that I have any time to play games. The other thing that we want to uh, differentiate from is the lost wake-up problem. Uh, and that is, well, if we wake up only one thread at a time, uh, there is a slight possibility that uh, we sometimes fail to get the message. Uh, and waking up one thread at a time really works best when uh, all threads are identical, there is linked in the notes a, a Stack Overflow page that talks about why this is the case. Uh, but if every thread is identical and you can say, oh, look, I woke up one thread and it does its thing and I know that it will tell the next one in line, all right, your turn, that could work. Uh, it is, however, not necessarily going to work if all threads are different and they all do different things because counting on all of them to coordinate their behavior correctly is hard. In which case, it's better to wake up all of the threads, then all of them will try to run and a bunch of them will get blocked and there will be a winner. But uh, it, is, uh, it is sometimes better than counting on each thread to always unconditionally wake up the next one after its turn is over is slightly dangerous.